1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that's still the next generation. I don't know how many generations have had that one, but that's like indelibly inscribed up in here. Isn't it? So we have a lot of things indelibly inscribed up here as well, too, that just come to mind automatically and not always such uh, as accurate as we would like them to be. So what you will hear today is merely a small introduction to help us really realize that all European settlers and Indians were peers and co-equals. But then everybody forgot. People forgot. And so now that's hurting us and adding some truth can help to free us and free us in our outer world and even free us in our inner world. So the Western Hemisphere meaning South America, North America, and Mesoamerica, which is Central America and the West Indies. So when I talk about Indians, I'm referring to the indigenous all up and down North and South America. So they had about 3,500 distinct territories. Most, in most cases, when I say territories, they were distinct. They knew where their land ended and where their land began and they had certainly different views about property than many of the other civilizations around the world at that time, but in terms of their territory of the state, or the province, the tribe, the town, and the city, they knew exactly where their territory ended. So population-wise, population of Europe around 70 million in 1492. In Western Hemisphere, it's ever-increasing estimates over time, settling in at around 100 million people, so they did have some good sized populations. Thousands of languages, that you, we don't know the amounts on that. The largest city in Europe at that time was Paris, which is 200,000 people. Largest city in the Western Hemisphere, Tenochtitlan, that was a city in what today is Mexico, 250,000 to 300,000 people. Now the world's first apartment complexes they had, which were adobe dwellings. They may build 40 or 50 or 60 attached dwellings together and add on over time. After a couple hundred years, it could be they have excavation sowing 600, 700, 800 of these units attached. So it was the densest populated place on Earth at that time. So the Europeans were not doing well in terms of health. It difficult for them to get good nutrition. They were growing barley and wheat, which are fairly demanding to grow. They didn't have a lot of livestock. The country was pretty much cordoned off in terms of the kings and queens and the noble system. No, nobles, dukes, barons, and earls were all like little kings and queens themselves. Most of the people, 85% of the people were serfs, a little better than slaves by today's standards. So nutrition, disease, that sense of well-being. Cleaning was something the Europeans just didn't do at that time. They believed that cleaning and bathing made you sick. The second law ever passed in the New World was against bathing. It was very bad for their health. And that was Queen Isabella that passed that law as early as 1494, passed a law against uh, the Indians being able to bathe. She herself bragged about bathing twice in her whole life, once when she was born and once when she was married. So it was like a badge of honor for these people. Elizabeth I was the same. They just believed that water, that sickness came in through the orifices in our body through the water. And that was backed up by the church because nakedness was closely associated with sinful behavior. So that all made sense to them at that time. 10% of the population of Europe was infirm in some way, so handicapped, um, lame, crippled, or hunchback, or deaf, blind, dumb, or just plain insane. One out of every 10 people. So in a 140 year period between 1540, or between 1500 and 1640, one out of every five people in the Western Hemisphere, uh, one, out of, sorry, one out of every five people in the world was killed in Indian epidemics, mostly by disease. So in that 140 year period, 20% of the world's population disappeared as Indians in these epidemics and that was caused by disease. So there's extraordinary gifts that these people gave us and gave to the world that really aren't being taught. Most places in the world you can go and the image of the Indian has been destroyed. Picturing other savages running around out in the woods with a diaper on in most cases. So that still prevails to this day, a lot of those images. So share these compelling stories. If you can, learn some great stories that can surprise people. Spread the word. And these aren't secrets. 
most of this is a well-documented information. It just because has become invisible to us. It's emerged. So some innovations and some inventions. Uh, superior footwear they had, and these are well documented with the early settlers and early explorers that they quickly adopted footwear, the types of homes, the medicines that they gave versus bloodletting, which was being used mostly throughout Europe at that time. They gave rubber to the world and industrialized the Industrial Revolution, which really our civilization today was founded upon, had steel and rubber and petroleum as the three main ingredients that went into that. So rubber was a really a big deal, became a huge industry worldwide very, very quickly, and they had ways of balkanizing rubber back then as well, too. Their calendar was more accurate than the European calendar. Now they had the zero a thousand years before it was independently discovered in the Mideast. They had a lot of pyramids. We know about the Egyptian pyramids. We all, somehow this information just exists outside of textbooks. It's playground information that my grandparents and parents and myself had. You just learn it when you're little. It's TV commercials, TV shows, movies. We get this information elsewhere, not necessarily from a textbook. But pyramids, they had hundreds of pyramids in South America and Mesoamerica. And some of them larger in square footage than the, the three that are famous in Egypt. Lots of pyramids in North America as well, too. They made them out of dirt called the mounds, but they also had massive pyramids, some as large or larger, too. Uh, the Mayans had many advancements. They had books that they were writing, codices they called them. They had medical journals. They were doing brain surgery, dental implants. Toothbrushes a long time before. And they uh, were doing <coughs> what we would call universal health care today. They had hospitals and they had nursing systems where they would have a hierarchy of training platforms for their nurses. So let's move on to some gifts of ideas and thought of the Longhouse people, which is more from this area of the world, the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois. They were called the Longhouse people. They lived in long houses, which were bark houses. And they have excavation sites of houses 450 feet long and 50 feet across. So these were no little huts and shacks that they lived in. They had good sized houses and they were good dwellings, uh, warmer and less drafty than the ones in Europe at that time. The great peacemaker in 1142, so over 450, 850 years ago, was the one who convinced these nations to come together and form the Iroquois Confederacy. It was the world's first democracy. And these representatives were nominated and elected and they could be removed from office, which got a lot of attention over in Europe in the land of kings and queens. So being the first, world's first democracy, historians began admitting 60 or 70 years ago that the U.S. Constitution didn't come from Europe and influence over there. It was directly imprinted from the Iroquois Confederacy, who they were close to and lived with and had a lot of administrative dealings with over a long period of time. And Congress officially recognized that in the 1980s. Uh, women's rights as well had its roots in the Iroquois Confederacy. They knew the women really well. It's a matrilineal society that they lived in. The women who, who gave birth to humans were thought to be the ones naturally to giving birth to things that come off the land. They were actually the landowners and they were the farmers in that society. But the suffragette, suffragette movement, the main, some of the people who got that going, Matilda Gage, Latricia Mott, uh, Susan Anthony's name is known, Elizabeth Stanton, they knew that they nominated, voted, and could remove their leaders and they were very close to these people and they were very influential. As a basis of socialism, Frederick Engels was very influential in Europe with Marx and Lenin and people like that. He based a lot of his, his writings on Lewis Morgan's study of the Iroquois, and they were fascinated with, with some of these Indian societies over in Europe. Uh, slavery had been outlawed since back in 1142 when they first began the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, rape did not exist. It was unnecessary for them to even have laws about rape. It was unheard of. And all European societies at that time had legalized wife beating and legalized marital rape. And children's rights, which is something I think that our civilization hasn't really got to yet, everybody had a voice in the Iroquois Confederacy, including children, at the age of reason, 14, 15 years old. They had a voice in their government as well, too. And that is a real democracy. 
In the United States, when they started, they had slavery. That's not a real democracy. Even the philosophers were influenced by the Indians because when they started writing about utopia around that time, Rousseau and Thoreau and Locke and some of these philosophers, and that's trackable back to what they, the type of societies that they heard that were going on in North America and some areas of Mesoamerica. The sense of liberty and freedom is trackable back to the Northern Indians when they sing, we shall overcome in the Arab Spring or when the German wall falls down, those are quote Americanisms or Canadianisms if you like, but that's trackable back, that feeling of liberty and freedom is trackable back to the Iroquois Confederacy as well too. So a checklist of what they did not have <coughs> be rape, seduction, child abuse and sexual abuse, poor houses, jails, theft, slavery, no domination or a sense of really being dominated, gender inequality, they did not have disease to speak of, no gallstone, kidney stones, asthma, obesity. Some of the big myths about mistreatment of prisoners and massacres have been debunked now. They didn't have standing armies really. In fact, they did no fighting off of their own land, most of the Indian civilizations. So look at your own day today. What do you love about our way of life? The gifts of the American Indian are all around you. Remember that these contributions, they help to form the foundation of today's civilization. So what type of society do we live in? What type of society are we trying to create? How are we thinking and governing ourselves today? Checklist of what they gave. Sense of equal rights, first democracy, our concepts of freedom and liberty, women's rights, children's rights, sustainable socialist ideas, world's first United Nations. So some gifts of health. They definitely gave to the Europeans the, some of the gifts of sense of well-being, cleanliness, nutrition, fresh air, some of these ideas, exercise, medicines. So again, I ask how are you living today? What type of foods are you eating? Well, 75% of the foods grown commercially in the world today were gifts of the American Indian. The corn crop yields amaze the Europeans, because corn gives a lot of food per acre compared to barley and wheat, and especially also rice, which is also very difficult to grow. So those are a couple of the other major world staples. Corn and sweet potatoes are very, very easy to grow compared to any of the foods that were in the Eurasia, Africa landmass uh, compared to the, the North and South America landmass. So the tomato they gave, the potato was, a, was also a world changer along with the corn and sweet potato. All the beans we know they have in the world today, dozens and dozens of beans except for two, the corn and soy which were from China. Eighty food plants are known to have come from one Indian nation in the Andes Mountains. Now if that isn't a great contribution to today's civilization, I'd like to know what is. One nation gave over 80 food plants to the world. That's more than all the European nations combined. So all of the Poles, the Germans, the Czechs, the Swiss, the Italians, English and French, the whole works did not give as much as that one Indian nation. <clears throat> 300 different corn plants they gave and had at that time, including the one the white man claims to have discovered in the middle of the 20th century, and some of those hybrid corns, which they also had. I grew up with Indian corn, which is this thing you wouldn't eat. You just look at it, right? So, so I don't know if that term is still as prevalent today, but they certainly gave a lot when they gave corn. How many potatoes they had in the Andes? Difficult to guess how many potatoes they had. You guys would know. Uh, 6,000 potatoes they had. Uh, so some misleading foreign names attached to some of the foods and other items. French bean, Egyptian cotton. India rubber, Italian bean, the Burma bean, Jerusalem artichoke, Italian tomato, Boston baked beans, the Irish potato, Turkish tobacco, Turkey itself, Madagascar bean, Belgian chocolate, Rangoon bean, Turkish bath, Hawaiian pineapple. So I want to repeat, all European settlers and Indians were peers and co-equals, but then people forgot. <clears throat> so why not recast some worldviews and attitudes? Let's increase our understanding and help those around us. Well, the attitudes, are, they're about to start hurting a whole new generation. It's a, it's a shameful legacy, really, and the harm is expected to be deep and widespread when the next generation begins to delve into this. Because it's a shameful legacy, and it's about to be revealed. 
And psychologists right now, as we speak, are advising school teachers what to say at the end of some of these classes as some of this information gets out. So when I talk about worldview, worldview really is a series of images in our mind, a bunch of pictures that we have. And so when I use that term worldview, I tend to think of the East Coast of North America, for instance, which will quite often be depicted as a pristine wilderness and just all this woods if you were going up and down there in a ship. What you would really see if you were going up and down there in a ship, which did happen in the 1500s, people did go up and down there in a ship, you would see villages, you would see towns, you would see an area that's taken families, small cornfields, 12, 15, 18 miles long. The Europeans take an awful lot of credit that doesn't rightfully belong to them. I think of the democracy example, for instance, which, of course, the Greeks, we owe the Greeks for democracy, right? But when you look at Greek society, it had a lot of very strange aspects to it that I teach in another uh, aspect of this. But certainly there were 75% of them were slaves, first of all. Uh, all the women were owned in that society, so they were chattel, they were property. And certainly the young people and the old people did not have a voice. Reading, writing, and arithmetic, all those three very important things were not invented by Europeans. They were invented by a very dark-skinned race thousands of miles to the south and introduced up into Europe. So there's idea, this idea that we thought all this up over there, that's what people think, that's what, and that's what kids today still think as well too, I mean, little kids. And it was the same for my grandparents or parents. All Asians, blacks, Caucasians, and Indians of the Western Hemisphere have all contributed equally to today's civilization. It wasn't that long ago you could hear the term white man civilization, like that's what this was. So it's time to rewrite the history books that the Indians put the white men on the map and taught them how to live in this land. They were always a welcoming people. And little children are not being given this information. The stories are not very proud. And an example about apartheid, when South Africa was bringing in apartheid, they needed a place where they could go. They wanted to see a model or get some clues on how they could bring this in successfully. And guess where they came? They came to Canada. Because we live with the Indian Act here, we're still living with parts of it today. Uh, where the Indians are, there's people and there's Indians and they're treated separately. So, feel better when you become guilt-free. Now, what bothers me? People will let themselves get hit with guilt every day in the news. Instead of feeling free, like they could. So let's deconstruct the lies and create some truth. Lead the life of understanding that you picture. So please help. Help people understand the facts, understand the truth, understand the world, understand our worldview, understand their own situation, understand their inner self, and literally understand their soul. That's when you can achieve your own personal truth and reconciliation.